welcome to Dare to Be Legendary, a Diversa Partners podcast. Each episode, we feature conversations with some of the brightest minds in tech, including founders, executives, and investors who are entirely disrupting this generation's ecosystem. They are the ones who dare to be legendary. Hi, everyone. I'm Paige Kadurka, partner at Diversa Partners. And today, I'm sitting down with Chris Lynch, co-founder and CEO of Rebellion Defense. Chris is a renowned entrepreneur who has worked to disrupt government infrastructure and revolutionize national security and became the founding director of Digital Defense at the Pentagon, where he was known proudly as the tech geek in the hoodie and was tasked with injecting some Silicon Valley innovation into an otherwise archaic defense industry by building what he calls a SWAT team of hackers who helped reshape the way defense thinks about software. As of 2019, Chris launched Rebellion Defense, a DC-based firm that seeks to sell software for defense and national security applications and is changing the way the U.S. and its allies conduct foreign policy around the globe. They are upending the traditional relationship between sovereign nations and their defense businesses. Chris, so happy to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for making the time. I appreciate it. Awesome. This question shouldn't make your head any larger, but you've had an impressive career. You have founded several venture-packed startups. You've led engineering teams at major enterprise companies. You were formerly the founding director at DBS. You are a lecturer at Stanford's computer science department and now the CEO of Rebellion Defense. Give us a bit of background on your beginnings, how you got your start, how that led into your current position as CEO. One of the things that I like to say is that the path and the journey to ending up in a place in both defense and then co-founding Rebellion is probably one of the most unexpected and circuitous journeys that I've ever been a part of. I'm a nerd. I like writing software. And most of my life and my career has been spent writing software or running software engineering teams or spending time, you know, doing startups or building companies. And in the most unexpected of things, one day I got an email from the White House that was kicking off a thing called United States Digital Service. And they said, hey, why don't you come join us for 45 days? And that began this completely unexpected part of everything. And I ended up working on a set of problems that dealt with something called service treatment records, which were essentially the medical records that veterans would end up using to get the care and benefits for what they deserve for their time in service. And at the end of my 45 days that I was asked to come out to join United States Digital Service, I was asked to meet with one more person, and this was going to be Ash Carter, the Secretary of Defense. And that began this completely random detour in my life. And that would eventually lead to starting Defense Digital Service, looking at the problems that are facing our nation and our allies and our partners, and how we both use technology to do the mission, something that is deeply meaningful, and then ultimately would give me both the confidence and the sense of passion that would come from wanting to stay in the mission and ultimately co-founding Rebellion Defense with Nicole Camarillo and Ollie Lewis. And it's just been an, an incredible journey. Government particularly has been recognized as more archaic and slower to disrupt. And as someone who has been at the heart of it at the Pentagon, now leading one of the most disruptive GovTech companies in the world, What were some of the bigger frustrations for you or obstacles that you faced trying to merge your forward-thinking tech brain, if you will, uh, with a slower-moving industry like GovTech? Is there a particular moment where you felt like disruption was actually possible? It's always fascinating when you look at these industries that just really haven't yet been consumed by things that we take for granted Sometimes in our you know, so- software careers or whatever it is that we're working on, we get so heads down that we're like, of course, this is just how everything works. And that's really not what it's like. And so uh, the first thing that I hung in the office once I actually figured out how to get an office at the Pentagon 
was a poster that said, get shit done. And this was ultimately going to form the motto of how we looked at the problem. And we said, okay, let's just look at things that are sort of mundane and normal and almost any other part of the world. And how are we going to get those things to be done here in defense or in the federal government? And so one of the first things we looked at, which would ultimately be incredibly impactful, not only at the Department of Defense, but in other parts of the entire federal government, was this idea of bug bounties, right? This idea that we would have ethical hackers help us test the security of critical systems that we relied upon for the mission. And what greater mission is there than the one of defense and national security, right? Something where every problem is actually deeply meaningful. And it turns out that there was no way to do that in defense or the federal government. There was literally no way to actually do a bug bounty, right? You had to pay hackers uh, who, were, who were finding these vulnerabilities, and there just wasn't really a system. And I went around and met so many people, person after person, who was like, hey, I am working on the policy. We've been working on the policy for this for the past three years. And ultimately, my team and I just kind of came back and said, okay, well, we're actually, instead of working on the policy for how we're going to do bug bounties, we're just going to do a bug bounty in the next three months. And we sat down with the secretary, Ash Carter, and we said, hey, we want to do a bug bounty and actually have hackers, you know, sort of beat the shit out of defense systems. And... He was like, I really like this idea. So here's something that hadn't been figured out, uh, that people had been working on for a long time, and all of a sudden, the secretary was bought into it. So we ended up getting Secretary Carter to announce the bug bounty program at RSA. We partnered with HackerOne, and we ended up doing the first ever bug bounty in the United States federal government. Now, while that might seem insignificant, what came after it was really exciting because it sort of set the gears in motion to allow that change to cascade throughout the entire United States federal government and other governments. All of a sudden, somebody sent me a late night talk show host making a joke about hack the Pentagon. We had we had representatives and senators on C-SPAN talking about hack the Pentagon and how other federal agencies should do the same. We had other governments come and visit and ask, how did you do this? How did it work? How do you work with these companies? What were you concerned about? And it sort of set in motion a playbook that others could adopt. And that was really exciting because it not only sort of made something which seemed very hard become doable, but then it also gave my team at the Pentagon the confidence, again, to just jump into bigger and bigger problems. And so while we started on something that seemed small and insignificant, over time, this would become the entire program for the United States federal government. It would sort of be the, the blueprint for it. And it gave us the ability to go after much more impactful problem sets that went deeper and deeper into the mission. And if we hadn't ever done those things and it had and if it hadn't turned out the way that we wanted, maybe I never would have wanted to co-found Rebellion because I wouldn't have believed that it would have been possible to come into this, into this thing that's so large and this sort of the, this colossal problem set that it, that seems unsolvable, but it gave us the confidence to be able to say, okay, actually we can do this and now let's go after something that's a lot bigger. Let's go get shit done. You know, it's, it's interesting hearing you speak back to that because I remember I was so frustrated for the first seven years of my career because I was doing all this important work in tech and these amazing industries, but I really, truly never felt like I was giving back to a mission that I was watching my husband fight for with his life every single day. It was because the fight seemed too big, the problem's too large for me to affect. And I think I realized what you probably realized at some point in the last four years or so is you just need to speak up and do something different and not be afraid of the blowback and hope for the domino effect. And it's why I love this emerging industry work. You get a chance to work with people like yourself who literally create and drive inspiration in something that seems overwhelming and unsolvable and get shit done. And you and I have discussed this before, but for the audience to hear this as well, the challenge that also existed in defense tech uh, for me and probably for you is it, it can be a polarizing and political topic of discussion. 
And I'd love for you to help the broader audience understand why you believe it is important and how others can further educate themselves in this realm. I think that it is up to us to create the world in the future that we want to be a part of and we want to live in and we want our children to grow up in. I think that sometimes it's easy to believe that some things are somebody else's problem or that somebody else is going to represent your beliefs or your ethical takes on things and hope that somebody is going to help implement how that works. I think you have to show up in the mission. I think you have to create that world. Every time that I go and I lecture and I talk to students, one of the things I say is, nobody is going to come and save us. It's up to us. And so I think that we have to show up and help create that. And in defense, I think that this is incredibly important because it's an industry and it's a world where a lot of change is underway right now. Most of defense and the way that we see things comes from this view of industrial manufacturing might. And we picture these incredible things like fighter jets or aircraft carriers floating in the ocean or GPS and satellites floating around in outer space or a tank rolling down a battlefield. That industrial manufacturing might, which has defined conflict for so long, is changing drastically. And software is going to help change that world. I also think that it's important to realize that the women and the men who serve our country and those that are allies and partners, they signed up to help protect our democracy, our way of life, our nation of laws. And they don't get a say. And if they're going to deploy into some place that is dangerous, in some place in which they are going to be thrown into conflict. They are doing so as a volunteer fighting force. And I want them, and I believe that we should all want them to have the best tools and technologies that are going to enable them to have information and decision advantage, the ability to understand where threats are and act before a threat can act. I think that that's what we should do. I believe that that's important. We don't get to define what other nations are going to do. And so it's up to us. Let's go build those things. Let's be a partner. People like you and people like me can actually have a profound impact because defense is changing as well. And while I might not have the courage to put on a uniform and go serve in the military myself, I can be a partner to them. And I can work to make sure that they have everything they need to have every advantage that we can provide. And I think that we should do that. And I think that we can do that in a way that we believe in, that we have pride in. And I think that we can do it in a way that inspires us to want to be better as a nation. I think having now had the good fortune to do a lot of work in this space in the last few years, I think the biggest shock to my system was learning that the majority of candidates that lean into this mission and these opportunities are in fact immigrants who recognize the value that our freedom holds. And to your point, I think they recognize it's up to us. They see through the political dilemma that exists or that we've created. But I can also understand the other side because it does seem big and scary from the outside looking in. And if I didn't have a personal experience in this world, maybe I would think the same thing. So I'm really curious to hear your answer to this question, but are there any misconceptions about defense tech as it pertains to national security or privacy issues or whatever that you think we should debunk here and now? I think that it's important to realize that everybody who's involved in defense is working extremely hard to never end up in a place where there is conflict. And I think that that is a big driver for how we look at the, the tools and the technologies that we envision, that we imagine, that we think about, uh, and how they might be deployed and used. I also think that it's important that everybody just realizes that, hey, we are, a, we are in fact a nation of laws. We 
have very strict lines that sit between the Department of Defense and other parts of either the intelligence community, with the, which is looking at broader threats around the world, as well as domestic law enforcement and how all these things come together. There are, there are incredible and very strong barriers that help ensure that each one of these different departments is truly doing what they are focusing on. And that's important as a place to start because we should start with, this is about good intentions and about ending up in, an, in a world where we hopefully can avoid conflict and we can do so by you know, not breaking down any of these things that I think that as a nation of laws, again, we, we hold near and dear to our heart. And when you think of how technologies are going to advance and be used and you think about some of the misconceptions that I think that people have, there's sometimes a, a misunderstanding of how all these different federal agencies work with each other, how they can or cannot share information with each other. And again, I'll, I'll just end up at this really important one, which is the Department of Defense is really focused on this idea of, hey, how do we actually deter conflict? How do we not end up in a place where we end up with catastrophic loss of life or consequences? And so that these are problems of impact that are deeply important. And you have so many people who are focused on it. And for me, that's probably one of the most motivating things about working in this, this area. There are so many things that we could spend time on that quite honestly, maybe it's a better way to sell something or it's a better way to build something, but it's, it's deeply motivating for me to know that the consequences that we deal with are incredibly meaningful. And sometimes we are trying to solve problems that have never been solved in the history of time. That keeps me going. And you get to work with just some incredible individuals, some who maybe came from defense or the military, but then it'll be people like me who maybe believe that we can help out in ways that we've never known that we could be a part of. And maybe that's one last thing that I'd like to debunk is that there's not a place for people like me. I think that that's not true at all. And I think that through my time at working in the Pentagon and of course at Rebellion and, and the things that we're working on, one of the things that's been deeply and profoundly life-changing is that like, wow, this is unbelievably hard and frustrating and the peaks and valleys are far and wide and tall and deep. There are moments where you will hit these peaks, these things that you work on, that will fundamentally change who you are until the day you die. And there's not very much that I can think of that I have ever had an opportunity to be a part of in my career that is like that. And so there is a place for the nerds, software engineers, and people like me to show up and people to have an impact. And, and I, I think about that a lot because as Silicon Valley grew up and became self-sustaining in its own way. And as it had less and less of a reliance upon government or military funding and research for the things that it was building, the reality is that this proverbial concept of Silicon Valley, this idea of our nation's smartest technical talent, they sort of drifted apart and they worked on other things. And so I think that that's important to realize that bringing those groups together is going to be incredibly important because the world is changing. And we do need to recognize that as we transition from an industrial manufacturing model of defense into one of software defining the characteristics of conflict in the future and defining advantage and who is going to ultimately going to have all the best capabilities and, and be able to keep uh, their country and allies safe. I think that it's incredibly important that we realize that actually there is a place for us and, and we need to start investing in that. And then, you know, 
that has been a very difficult thing up until Rebellion and a few other companies coming in and saying, hey, actually, we believe that we can build companies in this space, that it's not just for the companies that have been here for the last you know, six, seven decades. There's got to be a way to rethink this. Software is eating this world alive and it is going to, much like any other industry. So let's reshape that. And you have an awesome team. I think it's a major kudos to your leadership. I remember being so impressed by the fact that most of the Rebellion team joined the mission without any personal experience in military or family history in military. And I had just made an assumption that, oh, they must have the backstory, which is why they're so excited about the mission. But it was so impressive to me that you were able to bring together a group of people that are passionate about the mission no matter what. And that was really inspiring to me as well. And it brings me to another exciting topic, which is there's a very clear change happening in tech as investors have a brand new focus on national security, so much so that six defense tech startups have raised capital at $1 billion plus dollar valuations. And Rebellion was just named into the new defense unicorns acronym pronounced SHARP. I'm curious, what do you attribute to this strong interest from Silicon Valley investors in the last few years, given this political nature? So here's what's really cool. There are a group of investors who are now asking themselves, hey, are we missing out on something very big, something very important, something very meaningful. Is there a there there? Can you actually build a company in this space that doesn't look like the companies that have been there servicing this entire industry on the industrial manufacturing side for the past six or seven decades? And we believe very strongly that the answer is yes. I will say that it's different. It takes a different type of focus. It takes a different type of investment. It's a long game. There are things that you do here that you just wouldn't have at many other types of software companies or, or even hardware companies building technologies in almost any other industry. And I think that that is actually okay. And as long as you recognize that and you're fine with that as an investor and you say, hey, we're going on this for the long game, but we, build, we believe that we can build something extraordinary, something that is iconic, something that is enduring, then those are great elements to start with. And you're going to build differently in this area, as I was mentioning. For example, you're going to want to have people who understand the mission. You're going to want to have people who understand the problems, who can look at things and say, hey, here's what I did, and I would have been so unbelievably more successful if we had been able to do X or Y, and if I had something that could help me with this particular thing, and I never had it. And then you have somebody who could sit around and be like, holy shit, actually, what if we were to do this, and let's go build that? So you're going to want people who understand the mission and have the domain ex expertise, and you're going to want to have them sit around the table to make sure that you're building the right things to be able to go solve the problem. And I think that when you look at almost any company in this space, you're going to find a group of individuals who have a good understanding of what those problems look like in order for them to be able to step in and make an impact. But I do think that things are changing. And I believe that venture and the investment in this area is starting to expand beyond a very, very small handful of companies that have you know, historically dominated almost any investment that's going to touch defense and national security. And it's starting to, to grow. And that's really encouraging to me because my hope is that companies like Rebellion are going to pave the way because we're incredibly successful in impacting our customers' mission, which will then, I think, earn us the right to build an incredible and enduring software company that is going to, you know, help create you know, maybe a hundred other startups in this space so that we can actually have our nation's best technologists, our nation's best software engineering talent or builders creating problems for our incredible volunteer fighting force that is out there to defend us. I believe that that's incredibly important. You want to have both sides. It should not be a lopsided market. And I think that we're starting to see that come together now. That makes me 
really, really excited. But I'm not going to lie. There's still a lot of venture capitalists that are they have this attitude that says, hey, you know what? We're we invest in dual use or dual purpose, which is basically a code word for, hey, you're primarily a commercial technology company, and then you also maybe kind of sell into defense or federal government. I think that that's antiquated. I think that that is self-defining as to what the future of that is going to look like, because I think it means that everything's always going to lag or that you're not going to build things for specific problems that defense and national security are so focused on. And I think that we need to see more investment. We need to see more companies. We need to see bigger bets continue to come down into this space. But I am encouraged by, you know, both rebellion and our progress and the impact that we're having with our customer. And we're just getting started. We're not even three years old now. But I think that we can see a future where, hey, there's actually an ability to build some incredible and iconic companies here. There is a marketplace that our customer is going to look to, to help solve problems and buy from. And while it's not easy and it's not all figured out and you're going to be very, very frustrated, trust me, you're going to be very frustrated sometimes. It's okay because at least it mattered. And that, even on the hard days, even on the hard days, I wake up and I remind myself that it matters. That's why we do it. It totally matters. I get so excited hearing you speak and all the other founders that I work with in this space speak about the reason why they get up and do this, because it's a reminder for me as well about why I get up and do this, why I fight the good fight. And it's super exciting to me to understand all the lives that will be saved due to the fact that all of these people woke up today and said, I want to affect this mission. I'm ready to run through a wall here. Here's the thing. The mission of defense is one that happens every moment of every day, regardless of what is happening in our day-to-day lives. It is one where right now we have women and men deployed in dangerous areas who have shown up for that mission right now around the world. And that doesn't stop. It is not impacted by the stock market. It is not impacted by technology trends at the time. As a matter of fact, that mission still goes on whether people like me or people like you, whether we show up to be the partners that they need to provide and build better tools and technologies in order to help their mission. They will still be there to do that mission. And that is really important. And the reason that I'm calling that out is that those problems are still being funded. They're still being funded by Congress. They are still being worked on, and they still need people to solve them. And so while defense and national security are not impacted by what's happening in the markets, they need us now more than ever before. And really, this comes back to the last question around venture and investment and watching companies pop up in this space. It's actually more likely that the next wave of startups that are going to be built are going to need to work even harder to convince investors to give them the shot to build something to help our nation and the people who serve us in the military. And so I hope that those people will be given a shot because the ability to build a company here in this space is not being impacted at all. It's not like the government's like, oh, shit. Stocks are down. My portfolio is down 30%. I guess we'll just hold off on what we do to help Ukraine right now. (laughs) Right? Like this is happening regardless of what's happening in the market. So we need to, we need to think the same way. We need to play that long game. Agreed. So tell us, what does the future look like for Rebellion? Are there exciting projects that you could talk about? 
we're working with our customers on problems of impact and things that matter in the operational mission. And when I say the operational mission, that means we are there for the most important things that the Department of Defense and our national security institutions will be working on. We're wanting to be in there on the actual mission itself. That's so critical to keep that in mind. But when you think about what we're building, we're building things that are looking at how do we, how do we perceive threats on the battlefield? How do we, after we understand what those threats are, understand what the best course of action is that we might take? We call those things information and decision advantage, right? How do we have information advantage? And how do we have decision advantage, right? Having decision advantage means that you've done something before you're at the adversary has been able to do something. And that's really important. So when we think about the future here, I think a lot of this comes down to something a little bit simple, which is let's go into the future and imagine what it would look like if we were to build something based off of what we all understand today is the current state of technology. If we were to go into the future and ask ourselves, how would we use all these technologies together to provide the ultimate safety net and the ultimate set of capabilities for the men and women who are serving uh, on the battlefield? What would we build? We need to go build those things now because it's going to take time to get them out there because it is the mission of defense. So that means that we're dealing with consequences that are life and death here. So these are not areas where we're just immediately going to roll out any new capability at scale without giving consideration to, does it work? How does it perform in extreme conditions? What happens if it's in a disconnected state because communications are compromised? What do we do if actually all the computing infrastructure that we had depended on that's surrounding it was shut down, right? We have to build those capabilities. And so they'll be tested like that. So we need companies to come build now in order to create that future. This is not something that just happens overnight. But when you think about where this is all going, and you think about what we're, what, especially here at Rebellion, what we're focused on is this idea of we want to be the company that is providing the software to help them do that mission successfully every single time, right? We want to make sure that when they imagine using our software, when they see our logo on something that they know that it'll work for them. As a matter of fact, when we designed the logo, the designer that we worked with um, showed us an embossed version of our logo. And the story that we describe, which still resonates with me to this day, is imagine that there's a soldier sitting out in the darkness of night, running their finger over something and they feel the Rebellion logo and they can feel, okay, this is gonna work. I know that it's gonna do what it's supposed to and they have confidence in us to, to be a part of their mission alongside. That actually really resonated with me. I think it also speaks to how serious this is, right? And while we can't predict the future, and I think we've seen that this year with all the things that are happening, I think it's not too hard to look at the state of technology that is currently deployed in the military and how it lags almost any other industry that has been eaten alive by software and say, hey, you know what? We can do some amazing things here. We can build some incredible shit, right? We can build incredibly impactful capabilities for that person. And I hope that one day they'll run their fingers over our logo and they'll feel the rebellion logo and they'll just know that it's going to work sort of drives me every day to be honest you and i have spent a lot of time working together chris on architecting roles and sketching out the different archetypes and you know this but hiring in this industry is truly no joke there are a variety of variables to consider, and it's really, truly different for every role on the team. So for other GovTech and defense tech entrepreneurs looking to build companies that will ultimately end up protecting our national security and those of our allies, similar to Rebellion, what advice would you give those founders around hiring talent in this industry? Great question. A few different things come to mind. One is 
just to keep in mind that the further forward that you want to build a company in this space and the further forward you want to play in our customer's mission, again, the most difficult environments, the most difficult set of decisions, the most difficult parts of the conflict. What you're eventually going to run up against is you're going to have to think about things like clearances and making sure that you can have people who can hold and work with and ultimately deploy products in classified environments, right? And I think that that's one thing that is very unique here. And as you're thinking about that, and you're thinking about building your products and tools and technology, it does change some of the the ways that you might have done it at any other company in any other industry. You're just going to have to think about, does this person have a clearance? Does this person have the ability to get a clearance, right? Not all people will be able to get a clearance for a variety of different reasons. So if you're thinking about building in this space and you want to be in the the real operational portion of the mission, you're going to have to consider things like that. So that's item number one. Item number two is it's important that you think through a few things on the security side that, look, everybody's going to say, hey, we take security really seriously. We think that it's really important. Just know it's actually the mission of defense and national security. So your products are going to be tested in ways that you may not always love, right? And so you're going to have to make sure that you can also show the math and the homework and, the, and back up how your products are secured, how you make sure that the things that you're doing are not just kind of okay, but they're world-class. So as you're thinking about how you're building products and the types of people that you're going to bring onto the team, some of them are potentially going to need clearances, some of them are not, but you're certainly going to want to have a team that is building really good products that are secure. And by secure, I mean a couple different things. One is, remember, because of the fact that it is defense, in some ways, you're going to be going up against nation state actors. That's really scary. So how you even build products is going to come into the mix. So you're going to want to think about how do I make sure that I'm building out sort of a good quote unquote supply chain, even within my company and about how we create software or technology or hardware, make sure that it's not being tampered with and that we've done everything that we can to ensure that we have the best advantage to not be compromised by our customer's adversary, because our customer's adversaries are ultimately going to inevitably be your adversary, right? It's almost any other industry that you or software company, you could be like, oh, well, you know, maybe this won't happen, or maybe we won't have a nation state that's going to try to attack us until we're of a certain size. Our customer is constantly under attack. And that's really important to remember. So you're going to want to need to think about the people that you're hiring, the security, of the software that you're building and how they view that and how they can speak to it and how you can get ahead of it very, very early in the life cycle of the company. Two other things that I'll call out that I think are really important. Actually, it's really hard to sell things to the federal government. So because of that, you're going to want to have a team that understands federal acquisition. This is probably not something that most entrepreneurs or builders are going to have in their skill set. So you're going to want to find a great partner who can help you. And maybe this is somebody that you're working with outside of your company, or you're partnering with other companies in this space who can help you. But if you're thinking you're going to get somebody from the Department of Defense to just go swipe a credit card to use your product, ah, it's actually, this is probably, I get questions about this all the time from other entrepreneurs and other people who are creating companies or products in this area. And the question is, how do I sell? How do I collect money? How do I bill the government? And it's best to just have somebody you can rely upon to help you in that. And then the last one is something that I brought up earlier, which is you're going to need to understand the mission. You're going to want to have somebody who has recent relevant experience to be able to talk about the problems that are actually there today. 
what I do see a lot of people doing is they'll go and they'll try to get uh, somebody who was in service quite a while ago. I think that that is helpful to understand the mission, but it may not give you the current state. You'll want to have part of your team that really does understand in an authoritative way what the problem is looking like today so that you can make sure that you're staying focused on that. And that's where you can be a great partner because you don't want to solve yesterday's problems. You want to solve the problems of the future. And we want to build that future that I was mentioning earlier that we can all be very deeply proud of. And I think that you're going to want to get people who definitely come from this space and have a knowledge and an insight that can aid and assist not only in how, how you think about the capabilities and the, the different sets of ways that your product is going to solve things for the customer, but in also thinking about where. Re remember, the Department of Defense is huge. Literally 3 million employees. That includes military and civilian. It's a really big thing. With contractors, it's like 15 to 17 million. So, you know, just showing up at the front door of the Pentagon is only going to really get you maybe a guided tour. So you just got to think about it differently. And you have to think about your go to market, how you're going to build and you're going to want people who have a really good understanding of not only how to create uh, great products, be able to sit in conversations with those customers if they need to go into a classified space to be able to secure those products, to be able to sell those products and contract them, and then also make sure that you're going to make an impact on the mission. So those are some of the things that I think a lot about uh, when I give advice around how to build a company in this space. Really, really good advice, especially the advice to create the mixture of experiences in your team. I truly believe we need way more cross-pollinating of talent from other industries in this world, but it takes time. And, you know, similar to Rebellion and yourself, Chris, I'm in it for the long game too. And I know you've spent ample time with us. We are way past time. This is certainly not the end of our discussion on this topic. I feel like we have this conversation somewhat every week, but I do want to thank you for your time today. You know, I look forward to more changing of hearts and minds, and hopefully this podcast can do a bit of that. And I look forward to helping you save lives through software, one of my favorite missions. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for caring and thank you for making the time for me today. And, you know, let's show up and get shit done. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Dare to be Legendary, brought to you by Diversa Partners. Don't forget to subscribe, share with friends, and leave us a review. Stay tuned for our next episode.